Some people call this food, but what it is is a toxic waste site of chemicals so dangerous that the people who apply them have to wear hazmat suits. And the people who live nearby suffer from a host of symptoms, including increased cancer rates, lower IQ, hormonal imbalances, infertility and impotence, and even emotional problems such as aggression. When it comes to soil loss, habitat destruction, erosion, climate change, fossil fuel use, those are the real disasters. Places like this are literal deserts as far as nature is concerned. And here's another chemically dependent monster of a monoculture, lawns, drenched with Roundup. Isn't it enough that we spray poison right on our food? Do we also have to spray it on the places where our children and pets play? This is literally us killing ourselves. But of course we have to spray it. Just look at it. Corn as far as the eye can see. If you were a corn earworm, this would be the promised land. And all species when presented with a fabulous buffet of food like this are going to get fruitful and multiply. And the only thing keeping all the pest species in check is the biodiversity of other insects competing with them and predatory species preying on them. Thank Gaia for them. Of course, we kill most of those off when we till, and then we kill off more by planting monocultures and only providing food for a select number of species, and we certainly finish the rest of them off when we spray pesticides. And then, the only ones that can make a quick rebound are the pests, which come back in full force. So what you're saying is we produced a place with no predators, no competition, and food as far as the eye can see. <laughs> we couldn't have produced better pest habitat if we tried. I mean, it's almost like we planned it that way. Introducing the Pesticide Treadmill. This was a phenomenon predicted by Rachel Carlson in her book Silent Spring. And now the pesticide treadmill has been verified, documented, and shown to be quite robust. Spraying actually increases the number of pest species in a system like this, as well as the economic damage. That's got to be the best business model ever created by man. You get paid to create the problem you get paid to fix. Ha! which puts farmers on a treadmill of constantly having to spray more pesticides just to keep up. But it's not just pesticides either. We also have these treadmills for herbicides and fungicides and other biocides. And we have treadmills for our plowing and tilling. And we have treadmills for fertilizer. All of these things require constant inputs to the point where we have a chemically drenched society. Chemically drenched Great Lakes causing algae blooms and species extinctions and climate change, and cats and dogs living together, and biocides everywhere to the point where poisons like Roundup end up in our food, all of our water, and all of our bodies. No, this is more like it. This is no place of war. There's room for all species here. Room for life itself to thrive. Nobody has to spray poisons or fertilizers to keep the plants healthy. Nobody has to till to keep all this going. Because the network of life the interaction of all the species in the system works together to do all the work for us. Competition and cooperation keep weeds at bay, pests in balance, and continually grow the fertility and soil of a forest like this.
In ecology, this is called the diversity stability principle or the diversity resiliency principle. The greater number of species in an ecosystem, the greater resiliency is conferred to the individuals in that system, the greater freedom from disease and pest pressures. And wise, clever human societies all over the world, throughout history, including almost all of our human ancestors, have put this principle of polyculture to work in their gardens and food-producing systems. And if we were clever and wise, we would use the power of polyculture and ecological resiliency in our gardens and food producing systems too. We could put them to work for us in our gardens to reduce the time that we were spending on weeding, the time we're spending on pest prevention. We can use them to replace fertilizer and tilling so that we can get plants to work together the same way they do in an ecosystem, to take care of as much of the work for us as we possibly can, and produce gardens that are more naturally, holistically healthy, and thus are much more productive for us too. Which is all oh, why polyculture design is one of the most important elements of permaculture, and yet, because it can be quite technical, it remains one of the most mysterious and least discussed. I'm Mike Hogue of Lily House Permaculture, and in this series of videos, we'll discuss polyculture. We'll talk about simple principles we can use to maximize cooperation between our plants and minimize competition. We'll look into current experimentation, theory, and best practices from the permaculture community. We'll look at literally dozens of examples that you can use the next time you start a garden. We'll even steal some from nature by emulating truly wild systems in our garden, such as we've done with our edible hedgerow. And finally, we'll talk about how we can add up all of these principles, practices, and models to create the ultimate polyculture, an edible forest garden.